there. And uh, let's see, usually we just go around and introduce ourselves. So if you look at your screen, uh, first person, Francisca. Hello, my name is Francisca Rose. I work for the city of Beaverton and I'm filling in for the staff liaison to the snack this evening. Great. Next is Karen. Hi everybody, good, good evening. My name is Karen Perez da Silva and I am running for school board zone two. Nice to be here with you all. Thank you. Uh, Jeanette. Hello everyone, my name is Jeanette Shada and I'm running for Beaverton school board zone one. Great, nice to meet you. And Officer Maurer. Uh, my name is Dan, I'm with the Beaverton Police Department. Okay, great. And that looks like everybody, uh, so Francisca, on my screen down in the lower right, it says help. So do you, do you have that on your screen? It says help? Uh, I just have something, a blue little, it says help. Oh, how can we help? Oh, okay. Oops. So David, are you, are you seeing the rest? So uh, Leah and, and Lori, do you guys want to introduce yourselves as well? Uh, no, I don't see them. In fact, I think I just checked out. Uh, I just checked out of my visual. I don't know what happened here. Um, hold on, I'm going to check <clears throat> back in. Okay, well, while he's doing that, Leah, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I, good evening. Thank you for having me. My name is Leah Beata Lewis, and I am the Safe Routes to School Coordinator for the Beaverton School District. Thank you. And I'm Lori Leach with 12th and Hills. Thanks, Lori. And uh, I'm Eric Lear. I'm our uh, BCCI rep and a board member. There we go. I couldn't see Leah on my screen. Uh, hold on, let me see. Well, she we, 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 she oh, introduced now I see her. While, you were, while you were gone, so we're, we're all set. Great, and, thank and you. And we do have one guest this evening. I see Ronald in the audience, so thanks for being with us here. Okay, great. Um, okay, first off, um, let's go straight into Lori Leach's report. Great. Well, good evening. Um, yeah, so we've got um, with the park district, we've got spring registration open now. So we have a wide variety of options. We're continuing to expand. Um, we don't have a print catalog at this point and we won't have one for summer, but um, offerings will be available online. Um, and speaking of summer, um, save the date. We will be um, offering registration beginning Saturday, May 1st. Um, those, uh, those programs um, a large portion of them will be available for, um, for perusal online um, beginning Monday, April 12th. Um, there uh, is a, uh, a bunch of camps um, of different varieties and we're also expanding um, our virtual opportunities as well as classes. Um, we have a few building updates for you. Um, we've been obviously watching the COVID cases and the state guidance closely, and we're hoping that we'll stay in that moderate risk. And I think we're trending that way. So that's excellent. We're able to open some more centers um, and expand our hours. And we now have also the aquatic center open and are potentially looking um, possibly at Somerset, but that may be a little bit ways, a ways down the line. Um, spring maintenance uh, update. Uh, park maintenance are preparing and servicing the athletic fields and the sport courts for our spring programming use. Um, with the limitations of staffing and weather, it's been a bit challenging, but um, they're, uh, they're working really hard and um, working on getting caught up as well as uh, hiring a few more part-time staff, seasonal staff to help out with that. Um, also didn't help us too much with that storm. They're still kind of uh, picking up here and there. We had quite a few down trees and branches and some damage to a uh, boardwalk at the trail at the nature park. Um, on a positive note, um, over the last, uh, last couple of um, seasons, um, where did my notes just go? Sorry. Um, the last couple of seasons, uh, we've been able to plant uh, 35,000 trees and shrubs um, in natural areas. 
So that's a really great endeavor um, that's done uh, staff and we've had some contract work and then also some volunteers on some work parties. And just a reminder that we do have regular work parties around the district. Um, those are available to volunteer online um, using, obviously we're um, making sure everyone is uh, following the current COVID guidance on that. Um, new park development. Um, up in the north, there's North Bethany. It's a Highlands Park area. And that project is, um, is, has, was up for bid and now has been um, uh, taken to the board for approval and construction permits have already been approved. And the project's anticipated to start April of 2021 with a projected completion of October 2021. And then we've had some updates on our uh, park um, park names and some trail names. So um, a lot of that has to do with honoring um, diversity in our community as well as um, uh, some history. So a lot of research went into that. Um, some local graduate students um, specializing in cultural histories uh, took part. So we have Piu Piu Park, um, which is a new park at 187th and Bonnie Meadows Lane. We have Unity Park, which is also a new park near um, Southwest 178th and Alexander Street. And then there's um, Requito, a new park at Southwest 174th and Biles Lane. And then um, for an upcoming plaza in the area of Corn uh, Northwest Cornell and Joy is going to be Reflections Plaza. And Bethany Creek Greenway, um, Sato Trail, and um, Yoshihara for future trail in the Bethany area. Bethany area. And one of the things that we've um, noticed as the season, um, the weather gets uh, better um, and people are working more in their yards. Sometimes they need access to district property in order to get to um, the back sides of their property for various maintenance or construction projects. So if anyone is needing to cross um, into uh, district property in order to access their own. Um, they'll need to secure a permit of entry or a temporary construction easement. And they can reach Melanie Moon at m.moon at thprd.org or the phone number on that is 971-998-7618. Uh, and that's about all that's going on in the district right now. That's a lot. There is a lot. Yep. Um, you know, usually this time of year we're fully staffed and everything's raring to go. And we've just, we've had to, you know, draw down our workforce in light of, you know, the current situation, but we're, we're gearing up and we're looking forward to a, a great spring and, and an even better summer. Nice. So uh, the new park that they're going to build in North Bethany, mm -hmm. what's the approximate location for that? And what is it currently right now? Is it trees or pasture? Oh, you're asking all the hard questions today. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, sh I should know. And I don't have a map in front of me. So I don't know right off the bat, but I can, uh, I can get back to you on that specifically. All right. Well, at our next meeting. Yeah, yeah. can do that. That'll be great. Uh, does anybody else have questions for Lori? So, Lori, you talked about some of the new uh, names and things that are, are uh, you know, with the trails and plazas and such. Are there plans at like some of those parks to maybe just put up little boards or placards that, that kind of give the history of why, why it's named that? And I, I always like those. Yeah, yeah, I, I suspect they will. Um, I don't know if they've come up with um, a specific uh, signage plan for that, but um, but I suspect because they're they're wanting to as they are doing these um, cultural and historical um, what would I call them uh, uh, interpretive I guess you know um, identificate identifiers I bet I'm sure that they will there will be more of that but uh, if not I will um, pass that along as well too. Thank you. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have questions for Lori? All right, uh, let's move on to Officer Maurer, Beaverton Police. Hey guys, uh, how's everybody doing today? Hope everybody's doing good through this uh, COVID times. Um, not much here in the Five Oaks District, which is District 1. In, in, is my sound on? Yes. Okay, perfect, sorry. Um, 
Yeah, as far as the District 1 goes, um, not much has really changed. The DUI numbers have been staying consistent. Um, and I guess the main thing that's been um, kind of still huge since the um, – since the holidays is still the package thefts and the Amazon thefts and stuff like that. So just kind of be cognizant of if you're having deliveries home, uh, just be aware of when your deliveries arrive and uh, when they get there to your front doorstep, we're still getting um, a lot of those and uh, people are, are looking out for that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> as far as the COVID stuff goes, uh, looks like most of the department is uh, vaccinated, those who chose to get vaccinated um, and uh, business as usual. So it's uh, nothing much has changed. It's a day-to-day -day operation and things are going great. And so I'm, I'm open for any questions and I'll be glad to answer the questions as best as I can. Mm. Uh, okay. Any questions? I am uh, technically an SRO now. I've been with the SROs, school resource officers, since last, uh, was it March? Um, but I didn't get in the position until September. And uh, it's been an odd school year, uh, obviously, with the stuff going on. So it's been, I haven't really experienced the full SRO effect yet. So uh, my main school is ACMA, and um, uh, they're looking at going into their new building off 117th and Canyon, or 114th and Canyon here, it looks like in July is what they're looking at, and I also help supervise uh, Raleigh Hills, Whitford, um, Ridgewood Elementary, and Greenway, um, so... Um, I'm having a great time doing that so far. Nice. We we, uh, we talked with Chief <clears throat> Brochong at the uh, at our BCCI meeting last night, and she said the yeah. SRO program is still kind of up in the air as to how they want to go forward with that. Any yeah. Um, it as far as I know, it's um, <clears throat> it's still business as usual. We're, we're still um, taking calls for service, still helping out the schools and the school district. Um, <clears throat> but I I can't. I don't know any much more information other than that. If you have any questions in regards to that, you can direct those to uh, Chief Groshong or Sergeant McDonald, which is my sergeant. He's the sergeant of the school resource officers. Thank you. Okay. Other than that, if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to take off. Um, but like I said, I'm always up for helping out with questions or anything like that. If anybody has any questions later, um, I'll be happy to, um, I can give you guys my email. If anybody has a pen, they can reach me directly if you'd like, if anybody's up for that. Sure. Uh, it is D Mauer, M-A-U-R-E-R, -E -R, at beavertonoregon.gov. And the best way to get a hold of me is obviously through email. Um, I usually respond fairly quickly. Yep, that's it. Great. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, uh, hopefully next time we'll have a lot more questions. I'm, I'm eager, eager to help out. So, um, yeah. Other than that, have a great night, guys. You too. Be safe. All right. Take Thank care. You. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> Um, let's see. John, John is now in the audience. I'm gonna, he's on his phone, so I'm gonna bring him into the meeting. Great. On phone. And then since we've got a couple of guests and you know, we're, we're a cozy group tonight, I'm just gonna bring them into the meeting so that they can participate in real time with our, um, with our presenters as well. So great idea. Okay. Can you make everybody so they're visual? Yep. That's what I'm doing right now. Good. No obligation to be on camera if you don't want to, but you're welcome to, to be in this meeting as a full participant. And John, really quick, if you can hear me, if you press star six or star nine, um, that will, uh, star six? Yeah, star six, um, that will allow you to unmute your phone and then you can talk throughout the meeting as well.
All right. Is it my turn for the city update? Yes, it is. You're up. You're right. up. All right, so first things first, uh, the state of the city. Um, so Mayor Lacey Beatty shared Beaverton's recent accomplishments and upcoming plans during her first state of the city address. Um, the virtual event premiered uh, live on Thursday, March 4th via the city's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter accounts. And a video of the event is still accessible online at beavertonoregon.gov forward slash SOTC with a transcript of the recorded remarks. Um, this year's event featured comments by Mayor Beatty to share city happenings in 2020 and upcoming opportunities for 2021, as well as unique perspectives from business leaders, community partners, and more. Major topics include Beaverton's response to COVID-19, ongoing recovery efforts, homelessness, housing, and public safety. Uh, next is regarding the May special election. A special election to fill the vacant city council position one will be held May 18th, 2021. This position is elected at large to fill a partial term that expires December 31st, 2022. The filing deadline is Thursday, March 18th, or filing deadline already passed. Um, the, the website for more information is beavertonoregon.gov forward slash elections, but I will take this opportunity to put a plug in for the Beaverton Voters Forum hosted by BCCI that's taking place on Thursday, April 29th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. And you can get all the details on that at beavertonoregon.gov forward slash voters forum. I'll put that link in the chat in a minute here. And then uh, we've got the Public Safety Center Plaza naming. The community is invited to submit their naming suggestions for the recently completed outdoor public plaza at Beaverton's Public Safety Center. The deadline for submissions is Wednesday, March 31st. You can visit beavertonoregon.gov forward slash PSC Plaza to submit, subject, to submit suggestions, or you can call me at 503-526-2543. Any suggestion is welcome and can include a Beaverton resident, deceased or living, a tribal name or a general suggestion. A detailed explanation to give context for consideration is requested. A committee of volunteers will review the public submissions and make a selection of three to five names for council consideration in June. And an unveiling event will be held in August, either virtual, in person or a combination of both to celebrate the name selection and recently completed installation of public art sculptures in the plaza. And I'm the one overseeing the volunteer committee and really exciting stuff. So I hope folks submit their ideas. Um, and last but not least, city manager recruitment. Uh, the recruitment for a long-term city manager is underway. This position will serve as the city's administrative head and report to city council on the daily operation of city services and programs. And up-to-date information on the recruitment process and next steps will be available at beavertonoregon.gov forward slash city manager. And a community survey in here, it says it's expected to launch. It has launched and it can be found from the city manager website um, that will gather public input on key city initiatives and desired qualities to guide hiring. An appointment is expected to occur in summer followed by early onboarding. So those are the updates that I have tonight. I'll put all of those links in the chat here. Does anybody have any questions? No. And with respect to the voters forum, we, we're still soliciting questions. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually just added the question button to the website today. Um, so you can submit your questions. Uh, we're featuring the two races. So the um, city council position one, which has five candidates. And then we are also going to be uh, featuring the THP board of di the directors position. So we'll be featuring the candidate for position one, position two, and position three. Um, those are all uncontested, but we'll feature them as one group. And so you can uh, submit your questions for either race. We just ask that the uh, questions be directed to all of the candidates in a given race. And the question deadline uh, is uh, April 26th. So you've got a little bit of time before that deadline. And, and in case you're looking to ask questions, I can just let you know, we, we have a lot of questions for the city council candidates. Uh, last I heard, we have very few for the THPRD. So those would be great. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks for that plug, Eric. All right. So yeah, that that's what I've got for you all tonight. Okay, great. Uh, did you see the message from Ona? 
I did. Yes, that's great. And that sounds like a great idea, Ona. We'll, we'll look forward to chatting with you later. Yes. OK, great. Um, OK. Um, next up is Sarah Fisher Beachy of the Beaverton Education Foundation. Hi, guys. I apologize. I am in the car with my family. <laughs> <laughs> we're almost back to the place we're staying <laughs> right now but we were yeah delayed on dinner and we are my husband is rushing us back to <laughs> so if so i apologize it is spring break and i didn't quite realize that when we booked for the for this month but um i thought oh yeah everything's by zoom we can still do it it's no problem uh, so, the, so, the uh, luxury of being able to participate in a meeting from your car so, oh, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Hot spotted and, and ready to go. Um, so, um, thank you all. So, I am Sarah with the Beaverton Education Foundation, and um, I am the community, the teacher and community partner coordinator. And so, what I've really been um, trying to do is get our neighborhood associations and our um, and the unincorporated Washington County areas. Um, the CPOs um, to be to be more aware of the Beaverton Education Foundation and really partner with our organization. All the all schools um, and what we while they've been around for about thirty years, I only even um, came to know them um, about three or four years ago. And um, through my work with my local um, choice. Mm, okay, we may have to have her back. Resource, resource for our teachers Sarah, and staff. Sarah, we're, we're, we're having a hard time hearing you. You're kind of cutting out. Okay. I will be in a more stable Wi-Fi in just a moment. Um, <laughs> Well, let's... yes, it would, you know, if it would be easier, we could, we could sort of switch the order of some of our presenters, give you a little time to get home. Yeah, that's just what I was going to say. Um, I, I believe uh, at the Beaver, we, well, my friends are at the Beaverton Scouts for school. So if you want to switch our places, that would be really fine. Okay. So, all right, everybody, let's see if we can switch to Leah Bialdo. Yes, and my name is actually, I think there's a little typo in your uh, program. So it's it's Beato Lewis, <laughs> but oh, uh, oh. yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for having me here tonight. I do have a short PowerPoint to go along. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here and get that going. All right. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the Beaverton Safe Routes to School Coordinator for the Beaverton School District. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about our program with you tonight. Uh, we are a grant funded program. We're housed in the school district's transportation department and with the following mission statement. The Beaverton Safe Routes to School program is all about creating safe, convenient and fun opportunities for youth to walk and roll. And when we say roll, we, we're talking about bike, scooters, skateboards and buses to and from schools. This is important for the health and safety of our kids and to foster the creation of livable, vibrant communities. Safe Routes to School programs increase physical activity and improve unsafe walking and bicycling conditions on routes to and from schools and throughout the community. The Safe Routes program is a national program and we follow the 6E framework that's shown here. The six E's include education, these are pedestrian and bicycle safety classes that we teach both during and after school. Engineering, we work with the city and county to identify and prioritize infrastructure improvements on routes to schools. Um, so things like sidewalks and crossings. <clears throat> community engagement, working directly with our communities to provide programs to meet their individual needs. 
evaluation utilizing student and parent survey data to inform our program. Encouragement, one of the most visible parts of our program, these are our larger events like walk and roll days and bike rodeos and equity, which uh, you can see here can be thought of as an umbrella which guides our program delivery, sharing of resources, and it's incorporated into all the other five E's. So tonight I wanted to briefly share how Safe Routes to School is assisting students and families during comprehensive distance learning, how we're preparing to assist students who are choosing to return to in-person learning, and present a, a new opportunity for volunteers to lead walk and roll events and walk audits for their school community, and finally just to update you on our walk and roll events and education that we have going on right now. Um, so many of you know that our, our students are uh, returning to hybrid learning. Um, we have staggered start dates. Um, our K through second graders are starting April 5th, third through fifth graders, April 8th, our middle schoolers, April 19th, and then our high school and option schools will start April 22nd. Um, at that time, uh, only a portion of our students are opting to return to in-person learning. So we'll still have a large uh, population of students continuing to learn from home. Um, as you see from my background, we're uh, working with Metro to launch a Drive Like It campaign to create more awareness that students will be traveling at different times throughout the day than what we normally see instead of a 8 to 8.30 and a 2.30 to 3 o'clock, um, our start and end times can be uh, staggered throughout the day. We have students learning from home who might be taking a bike break in the middle of the day. And so we just wanna bring awareness to drivers um, to be extra cautious of all those students who are gonna be out in their communities. Um, let's see. So we all know that sitting in front of screens can be wearing on us and our kids so it's even more important uh, that they have time outdoors to move their bodies research shows us that being active not only increases student health it also increases academic achievement focus mood and mental health so while we've enjoyed maybe more time indoors as families uh, going for a walk or roll in your neighborhood increases our opportunity to see friends and neighbors uh, from a safe distance and feel uh, more connected to our communities. So since uh, last March, when students started distance learning, we've developed several online resources um, that are available on our website. And I'll put the, our website in the chat at the end of this presentation. Um, we have uh, several virtual activities and events uh, to continue to encourage students to learn and practice pedestrian and bicycle safety. Um, we have a new remote resource guide on our website. It has route ideas, safety information, including videos uh, about things like how to cross the street or how to fit your helmet correctly, and activities to do while you're out walking and biking. Additionally, we've created a messaging toolkit. This is for schools and parent groups to easily post safety and encouragement tips in their monthly newsletters. Um, they could simply copy and paste uh, the blurbs, you know, one per month. Um, and finally, we've created a mindful walking resource guide. Um, it teaches um, educators, caregivers, and even just our community members how to incorporate a mindfulness practice into your daily walk. Um, the resource guide also comes with a social emotional learning lesson that we've provided for counselors and teachers to use with our students. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, with our students returning to um, in person instruction in April, we've updated our website to also include safe travel information to assist our students and families with plans for how they will travel to and from school. We've provided uh, suggested routes for walking and rolling. We have safety tips for all modes of travel. Um, additionally, uh, students and families can find their arrival departure maps. So these uh, are for all of our schools and they show how students should travel either foot, bus or car and kind of the routes they should move through um, on campus. 
And then um, it includes a standard information about COVID safety um, to encourage parents to complete that health screening prior to, part to departure, um, to ensure that they're wearing face coverings when they're out, um, whichever mode of travel they choose and maintaining that six feet of space. Uh, this school year, we also started a walk and rollers leadership team, and this is um, a, a monthly meeting to assist us with recruiting volunteers at our different elementary schools and middle schools to assist with a monthly walk and roll day. Uh, several of our schools have been doing a virtual kind of first Wednesday of the month. Um, they just promote on social media to remind um, people to go for their walk or roll that day. Um, parents can respond kind of with an emoji or a picture maybe of their family out enjoying their trip. Um, and then the coordinator just kind of counts those up and, and provides us with that data. Um, a few of our schools have had some in-person uh, monthly walk and roll days where students can um, walk by their school and pick up a prize. Um, those are usually coordinated with kind of like a library book pickup day. Um, so we'll continue to work with expanding that um, to include our, our in-person um, travelers as they return to school. We recently started working with some of our NACs to train volunteers to complete walk audits for suggested school routes. Um, we had our first training uh, last Friday. Um, a walk audit is just a basic safety review of a route um, and you can just fill out a simple checklist um, while walking the route. Ideally, this would happen during um, a typical student travel time. Um, that's a little tricky right now. So we're just encouraging people to walk the route at any time during the day. Um, so if you're interested in something like that as a volunteer opportunity, you can always contact us. Um, we utilize the information from those walk audits to help us prioritize and advocate for infrastructure improvements. Um, so they're, they're very helpful. All right, we're almost to the end here. Uh, our remote pedestrian and bicycle safety. Um, we launched a Star Wars virtual escape room this month. Um, this was aimed towards our middle school students. It's been super successful. We've had over a thousand middle schoolers participate and learn about bicycle and pedestrian uh, safety education. So we're excited um, to see that happening. Um, by completing the activity, they're entering a raffle to win um, kind of a bicycle safety prize pack. And after the month is up, then we'll put that on our website. It'll be open to the public. Um, in the meantime, we're also working on a street smart biking online virtual uh, pedestrian bicycle safety. And this, this unit will be aimed towards our elementary students. Right now we've partnered with Marathon Kids. We're, uh, we're promoting a spring fun run during this week of spring break. Uh, encouraging families to go for a one mile family fun run. Um, if you have an elementary Beaverton student, they can log the miles in their Marathon Kids account. Um, and all that information and safe running routes and safe running tips are on the Spring Run website. All right. <laughs> That's kind of my update. Oh, I wish I had my water. I forgot it tonight. My <laughs> voice is getting dry, but thank you. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about our program. Um, like I said, I'm going to put um, my email and our website in the chat, um, and I'll just open it up to any questions. I'll stop sharing here. Uh, I have a question, and it has to do with, uh, for instance, I live near Five Oaks, yep. and at a certain time in the morning, the lights come on and they flash and drivers are supposed to slow down. Yes. Uh, if we have children coming to school at all sorts of different hours, are those lights going to be adjusted or how? Oh, so they are. Uh, yep, they're, they're gonna be timed with the arrival departure and they'll be coming on at multiple times in the day, depending on uh, you know who who's coming and going. Sometimes we'll have a, an AM you know, arrival dismissal and a PM arrival dismissal. So they might be coming on at two different times uh, 
well, that would be four total different times during the day. Yep. So all of those have been timed. Uh, the district and uh, the city and county have been working on those. Nice. Okay. That sounds good. Uh, let's see here. Yes. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Anybody else have questions? I guess not. Okay. Well, thank you again so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sarah, are you back in touch? Yeah, hopefully. More. Nice. Although it says, it says my internet's unstable, but I'm in one location. <laughs> Great. You're, you have good visual and audio right okay. now. Excellent. Excellent. OK, I will. Um, so little introduction in case you didn't catch it before, I'll say it quickly. I'm the teacher and community partner coordinator for BEF, the, which is the Beaverton Education Foundation. Hopefully you've heard of us, but what I'm here for is that I am I figure that you probably have not, even though the, the organization uh, as a nonprofit has supporting only Beaverton schools has actually been around for about 30 years. Um, if you're anything like me who moved um, into Beaverton uh, about five years ago, I did not hear about it for a couple of years. And once I did, because of my involvement with my children's PTO, um, I became involved. What I uh, learned about them was they have a crowdfunding site called Beaverton's Choice, which is um, there's a list of projects up there anytime for people to go in who are interested in donating money. Um, from the community um, to, to, to pick and choose projects. Um, I, a lot of people have heard of Donors Choose, which is a national crowdfunding platform. Um, and we've brought that in to Beaverton um, for our teachers and for staff, actually. Um, it's for anybody, a bus driver can apply, um, that kind of thing. Um, you know, the school secretary who sees a need for her school. Um, can, can apply. So um, what I really found was that, um, that we really need to outreach and that's what I'm here to do. I believe I've, I'm involved with the city in Washington County quite frequently on other issues and what I saw was a need to really partner with our community organizations like the neighborhood associations and the community partnership organizations um, throughout Washington County. So that's really my purpose um, is to is to introduce you guys to Beaver to Beaverton's Choice and the Beaverton Education Foundation. What I would like to do is always be to have a to be a conduit for us to communicate uh, that we could share projects that are going on at, in the schools in the in your NAC. Um, and and give you updates so that you can share them and promote them, um, get that information out. Um, I think we um, want strong communities, and we want we know the, a lot of the foundation of strong communities is strong schools. Um, so I really want to bring that partnership together. So that's my purpose, um, and I hope to keep a com continuing communication with you all. Um, what I'd like to show you is a little introductory video um, real quickly, and then I will talk, talk to you about the uh, projects that I know that we've done just in the last couple of years um, in the schools in the, in your, the Five Oaks uh, Trouble Creek Neighborhood Association. So let me switch over and share this video for you. An education Foundation's mission. To Let me make sure it's all the way back. The Beaverton Education Foundation's mission is to connect our community and classrooms to provide all Beaverton students access to the people, tools, and experiences that expand the depth, breadth, and relevance of their academic journey. For 30 years, the Beaverton Education Foundation has supported programs and projects that enrich the learning and actively engage students. BEF strives to fund at every one of Beaverton's 53 schools and reach as many of our district's nearly 41,000 students as possible. We accomplish this through our cornerstone programs, Kids Count Grants, Safe and Sound for Student Success Middle School After School Programs, and Beaverton's Choice. 
We also support emerging and innovative projects and programs. Things like Future Bus, Art Day on the Go, Digital Access for All, and Innovation Exposition. Beaverton Education Foundation partners to fill in the gaps, incubate a promising idea, optimizes an opportunity, serves all students with hands-on learning opportunities, connects the community and the classroom. Thank you to all of the school staff, partners, and community donors for helping support student success in Beaverton. So, and then I will want to show you our landing page where you can always find what projects are up. Let's see. Always have to find the right one. Um, let's see. So, if you go to the Beaverton Education Foundation, you'll see our landing site. Um, and then if you go up to support and our Beaverton's Choice page, you'll be able to see the selection of um, projects that we have up. Sometimes they are um, student-wide or district-wide, like the BSD, there's um, a student initiative for a um, basically a juvenile diabetes uh, group, uh, support group to um, that, like I said, the students combined with some nurses, school nurses um, came to us and said, you know, we want to start this program. We need, we need support throughout the community um, and we want to help the kids who, who are being diagnosed with juvenile diabetes find support and kind of help us band together. It's kind of a di district wide, it's not a school specific one. Um, so that was a really original student led initiative that we're helping to fund right now. Um, and then we've got, we've got actually got this one program at Whitford um, right now to help with um, the career technical education um schools and through and then there's a summer school program and it's just some really really interesting um basically it's the trades combined with stem um that we're really bringing in your the middle schoolers um and that's why it's it's just we work a lot with the district on their programming what the needs are out there but what we try to do is i really work with the teachers and the staff members who are on the ground with the students who to see it to see where the gaps are between what the you know the red tape what the state is bringing down what the district is bringing down and it's the sometimes the the staff member gets kind of stuck um, so we say what do you need especially in this time of remote learning hybrid we've really helped them pivot um, to what you know, what's most instrumental, what's impeding you from reaching students. You know, one of the biggest things we found out, again, especially for middle schoolers, which is so important for the Five Oaks community um, in, your, in, in your neighborhood association, that um, middle schoolers really tuned out. It was, it was a big problem with middle schoolers. Um, and to keep them engaged and wanting to come back to school, um, to turn on their camera. Um, we had, there were some middle school teachers across the district who said, we'll go out. We will go out to apartment complexes, to parks. Um, we, we want to go find these kids that have dropped off. And we helped them with uh, an initiative called Canvas Caravan. So Canvas is the school program that the school, that the students interact with where you get grades and feedback and the parents log on to and stuff. So that's Canvas. So they did made it a caravan. They needed an outdoor screen, a projector that you could see outside, um, a little mobile hotspot. And they went out to these communities to find these kids and contact them, contact the parents and get them re-engaged. And it just made all the difference in the world. It's a relatively small number of students but it was so impactful 
um, to make a big difference. So it's just, and it, you know, a thousand dollars with, and we've got some community funding and, um, and community partners like Intel, um, First Tech to really help with those things. And so a lot of times we just need, we want that story to be told in the broader community. So that's why we want to go out and help and partner with the NACs to, um, to get that message out and to inspire and to let, the, to let the people in your community know that this is going on and there are people that are helping and those teachers are going the extra mile and here's how you can help. So that's our thing is, is bringing the community and the classroom together. So that's what we really want to want to focus on. Some of the projects that we've done, specifically in your schools. Let me switch the sharing again. So many screens. So over here and share and my little screen. Okay. So um, one of the big projects we did that for was for Sunset High School, this don't freak out community event. Um, and it unfortunately got postponed because of COVID, but the teacher just um, got it restarted and they're they're trying to launch this um, there in about a month or so. So hopefully you'll be hearing some things in the community from Sunset High School. This is gonna be a really, this is one of the bigger projects at $7,000, um, but it's bringing in some speakers um, to really help parents um, partner with their kids and their community. Um, to help in parenting and shepherding. Um, we have down to a kind of a simpler project. Um, a senior math teacher at, at Sunset wanted her kids to be able to take a math virtual field trip. Again, um, $800, you know, we were able to, half, to fund it halfway and um, through the community we uh, crowdfunding so be, through Beaverton's Choice, we were able to, to make that happen for them. Um, and I've just chose a couple of projects for each school in your area. Um, this again for Sunset High School a couple of years ago, um, book characters for Sunset High School Library. Historic fiction, um, they really just wanted to, uh, the teacher Megan Stoffer just needed to get some more books in her classroom, especially with everyone complaining about how virtual we are and all the kids are stuck online to get a physical book in the in kids hands is, you know, can really make all the difference um, in inspiration and engaging of, of our students. Um, a couple of years ago, we helped fund microscopes for the fourth graders. And even on our Merlot Station, if you're not familiar with Merlot Station is actually an alternative program through the Beaverton, um, Beaverton School District. Um, this was, I just thought this, this was actually $1,000 a few times. Um, it was, it gets the kids, these are some of your most at risk students. Um, and they're pulled from all over the district. And um, Merlot Station is in the your NIC, um, it's just a really innovative, um, engaging and mind challenging for, for, the, for the students. It's really interesting. Um, we also help with what we call Homes for Hounds. Um, it was a CTE, a career technical education program. Um, this picture is from when BSD students helped build and pour a curve in a parking lot. I mean, hands-on, real-life training um, is one of the things that, that the CTE programs are really um, focused on. 
with the homes for hounds, they were actually, we gave them the tools, materials, um, they built dog homes, dog houses for one of the local shelters. So that was really cool to see them give back also to our community. Another way that we partnered, further partnered through, um, through the foundation. Um, we have at Five Oaks, they had an anti-racism team. Um, they wanted to, to get more books, um, diverse books into their libraries and into the hands of their kids. So we helped to fund that. Even down to, this was actually just about a week or so ago, a culinary club. There is a beautiful, just great teacher named Luke Martin at Five Oaks. Um, he does this on his own time where he is Zooming with kids and their families um, to create, to make recipes. And some of the kids just need help getting the ingredients for the, to do the recipes. They Zoom on Wednesday afternoons and Sunday afternoons um, to all cook together. It's just amazing, wonderful, again, extra mile thing that, that this teacher is doing. Um, and then at McKinley, um, this beautiful sensational sensory studio. Um, a lot of the schools want one. Um, they were able to fund this. Um, we were able to, to help them, um, not only for, it's usually um, specified for your special education kids, but we really are finding that um, all of our kids uh, could benefit from the sensory stimulus and, and um, just a place to go to calm down sometimes, um, even if they don't have a spe specific diagnosis. Um, so we're really helping our kindergarten and first grade um, teachers across the district are really seeing the need for a sensory room. Um, but also, and this was actually the very first project I helped with when I joined Beaverton Education Foundation, is this purposeful play for McKinley. Um, it just, it's getting, I think there was this, there was a trend in education that a long time for a while there that um, we didn't have imaginative play anymore. Well, our teachers have been saying, we wanna bring it back. And the Beaverton Education Foundation is helping them do that um, with, with dress up um, clothes and, um, and just, uh, Block, building blocks and things that they can just use their imagination. They're not preset things. It's to get them to play. Um, and what's actually funny, it's that when you read the research on this stuff, and I could go on and on, but it's actually so tied in with executive functioning, being able to get along with your coworker, um, you know, learning how to take lead, have leadership. Um, these are actually these foundational um, you know, skills that we learn in kindergarten through just regular play are, are what we're talking about as far as executive functioning later in life. So um, to bring that stuff back, it's all these things that you hear about in all the scholarly journal, journals and everything anymore. And our teachers are on the, the front lines of that stuff. They're saying, yes, we need the materials. We'd love to do it. We want to do it. We just need the funds to do it. And that's where the Beaverton Education Foundation has, has come in. And we know our schools want to support it and we know our communities want to support it because um, they know what's best, what's needed for our, for our students. And it builds stronger communities when we support each other. So that's why I'm here. And that's why I hope I answer any questions anytime. And I hope to be able to continue to communicate with you guys share our projects and let you know what's going on in your local schools so that you guys can, we can work together to build up that relationship. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Oops, let me get back here. All right, so does anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh, next up is we're going to do uh, some NAC business. And 
Um, let's see. Is is John here? Can he hear? He should be able to hear, and okay. he should be able to have video too. Okay, I'm just wondering if maybe I'll, I will postpone approval of minutes for till next meeting. We can just do that. So the next thing is treasurer report. So, John, if you can hear me, can you give an update? Just needs to unmute his microphone there. Are you able to unmute him, Francisco? I'm asking to unmute on the on on his. I can't like forcibly unmute him. I see. But fortunately, well, maybe I I can do my BCCI report and then oh, help. Okay. There, John, can you hear us? Okay, let's go on to Eric here. Go ahead, Eric. Okay. So we had several items this month, the BCCI. First, uh, Megan Bronston from the community, de community Development Department came and gave us an update on all the new wonderful restaurants that either have, have gone in or are going in in the downtown area. Um, we, we, because we moved our NAC meetings, the BCCI meeting was literally yesterday. So there are some presentations that come along with this that I will share with the group when I get them. I don't have them yet. Uh, but suffice it to say, there have been a, a quite a bit going on downtown in terms of new restaurants uh, that either have gone in or will gone in or will go in soon. It's very exciting. Uh, I would encourage everyone you know, to safely go downtown and explore some of the, of the new places, particularly uh, the old Beaverton Bakery and then the, the building next to it, which was Big O's. That now has been replaced. There's now a uh, a brewery, a burger place, and a coffee shop going in that that area there. Nice. Yeah, bun bunch of really, really interesting stuff. Uh, we also got an update on the First Street Commons. That's the area on First Street downtown that's currently blocked off and has the tents and the heaters and everything. Uh, the plan is that's going to extend through the summer, uh, you know, even as, as restrictions get lifted. And there is some discussion of that actually becoming permanent. So the plan is to do a survey of the city and see, see what people think about that. I mean, you're giving up a little bit of, of you know, I guess, traveling ability and some parking spots. But in exchange, we, we've got what I personally think is a pretty cool area, a good gathering ground and something that's, it's, I imagine, pretty good for those downtown <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, next up, we got an update from Scott Keller and Kevin Boylan uh, from the sustainability program on the climate action plan. Uh, they gave us a brief update and the biggest thing they pointed our attention to is there is a an annual report or an update report that just talks about uh, what what's gone on in the last year. And I will put the link to that report in the uh, in the chat. But I would encourage people if you're interested in you know climate change, sustainability program, and all that to, to check it out. And finally, and this is something you know, David, you can, you and I can chat about this for uh, an item on our agenda next month. But something that the BCCI has been working with, and particularly the Land Use and Transportation Subcommittee, uh, of which I'm a member. What we're trying to do is work with the traffic commission on the traffic calming program. For anybody who's not familiar with this, this is the, the process by which you would get something like say a speed bump put into your neighborhood if you felt people were driving too fast. Uh, the current system is set up such that it's very difficult to get new uh, projects approved. Uh, you have to get Seven or 67 percent of every uh, household or every eligible uh, voter in a particular area has to agree. Uh, and that the the issue with that that we've brought up is that if somebody gets a so the way this works is if you're in an area that's going to be affected, uh, a postcard card is going to get mailed to you, and you say yes, no, or abstain. The way it's currently set up is if you get one of these postcards and you just 
throw it away or don't send it back, that's considered a no vote. That counts the same as a no vote. So in order for these neighborhoods or areas to get 67%, you really have to have, you have to have at least 67% of the people have to vote and they all have to vote yes. So it's just, it's been, a, it's been much more onerous since they used the system. Very, very few projects have gone through. And in our conversations with uh, various community members, uh, the different NACs, the feedback has been, this isn't great. This is not a good setup. So what we're trying to do is to go, go out to the community, go to the different NACs and, and get some feedback on, you know, what, what do the neighborhoods think about this? Is this the right way to be doing it? Or is there maybe a better system? So what we're going to do is we'll give a little presentation uh, at, at our NAC and then at each of the NACs over the next month, and we'll have some additional information and then we'll, get, we'll take feedback from the community what do you guys think? And if the consensus is that the community wants a change, we'll bring that back to the traffic commission and and you know further that discussion and hopefully hopefully have some get some action taken on that. So that's something to stay tuned for uh, next month. And I think that was everything. Yeah, and then the Francisca mentioned the um, voters forum. So keep an eye out. The the there's a postcard that it's getting mailed out this week, I think. It'll get uh, mailed next week. Next but week. it'll hit all mailboxes in Beaverton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, you know, they've historically been really, really good. Uh, one of the members of the BCCI, uh, Eric, who's been around for many, many years, always is host and does a fantastic job as a moderator. So I would encourage everybody to tune into that. Former newscaster. Former newscaster, and, and, and you can tell. <laughs> yeah. Shows. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, um, I wanted to make an announcement. The board members know this, but uh, nobody else does. The, the NAC uh, had a unanimous vote on donating money to the Patricia Reeser uh, Performing Arts Center. So our NAC donated $1,000 this week. They're trying to finish up their donations. They needed $100,000 more. So we decided we would donate $1,000, which we did. And um, are, are there any other comments before we go to visitor comments? Okay. Let's go to visitor comments. We have two women that are running for different school board positions. Uh, let's start with zone one is Jeanette. Uh, how do you pronounce your last name, Shade? Shada. Shada, okay. So take it away. Uh, you can have five minutes, no problem. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you for having me tonight. And uh, yeah, shade, I get shade a lot and that's okay. Um, so my name is Jeanette Shada and as uh, David mentioned, I'm running for the zone one position, which you guys are zone two, which is on the west side. I'm over on the east side of the district um, with Hall Boulevard, 217, Shoals Ferry, Allen and Denny Roads are some of the main roads that some of you may know on where my zone is. Um, I have been in education for 23 years. I have come up in the ranks of education from being a teacher's aide to a substitute teacher so I could raise my three children and have the option to stay home or work when I wanted. And then when I moved to Lapine, Oregon in 2005, I wanted something more. So I went and was in the first cohort for the OSU Cascade campus for the master's program and the teacher's education program together. So since then, I've been teaching high school uh, English. I originally started out as an elementary, wanted to go into elementary education, and my path took a different route. Then in 2017, I um, did a soft retirement. Uh, my three children, teenage children at the time, needed me at home more than uh, I needed to be teaching. And so I stayed home and helped my three teenagers and anybody who has teenagers know they can be a challenge. So um, stayed home with them. And then we moved here and we were in Texas at that time. 
And then we moved back here to Oregon in 2019, October 2019. Um, my husband's job transferred us here. So the three biggest things that I'm running on is one, to fully open schools safely. We need to get kids back into schools because their mental, emotional, physical, and academic well-being uh, for many, many students is suffering. And the school has, or in the classroom is where a lot of magic happens to where there's social interaction and things like that. The second thing is to uh, restore objective and age appropriate sex education and also achieve a balance and historically accurate history and civics curriculum across all the grade levels. It's very important to make sure we have that accurate information given to students and also teaching them about um, the founding principles and documents and people of our uh, country. The third thing that I'm also running on, which is a longer range goal, is uh, building up the career and technical education program to make it much more robust than it is now. And I appreciate Sarah's um, presentation because what she does there is actually uh, something that I would hope that we could work as a board and as a district to build up even further uh, with the graduation graduation rates here in uh, Beaverton School, we can definitely get that career and education, technical education program built up to retain more kids for graduation and help them build the skills to be immediately employable upon graduation from high school. So those are the things that I'm running on. And uh, I will put my website in the chat along with my email. And if you want to contact me any further, I would love to chat with anybody. Okay, uh, does anybody have any questions for Jeanette? I have a question. Um, so your, your, your second uh, topic or, or, or pillar, I guess, about you know, ensuring that accurate history, civics, all that is being taught. Um, and and for, forgive my, my general ignorance of, uh, on this subject area, but how do you determine the appropriate source for materials? I mean, I, I guess in, in general, but especially for something like this. Oh, you're on mute. I apologize for that. Making sure go. that there are um, factual data points in there that come from several sources and not just one. And um, if anybody knows about the SB 683 that's going through the legislature right now, they want to have the 1619 project be the uh, history that is taught in the Oregon schools. And it's already been debunked. Even the New York Times has uh, found extreme falsehoods in that curriculum. And we cannot have false curriculum going in to teach our students what is going on. We need the factual, um, down to the basics, nitty gritty, what happened, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because history is ugly. But our, we, we learn history, so hopefully we don't repeat it again. And if we don't learn it, then there's a potential of it repeating again. And we also need to teach history um, to help understand cultures, ethnicities, different races, so that we can unify instead of divide. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a quick question. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. Yep. OK. Um, I was just wondering, do you think summer school should be an option or should it be mandatory for all students this summer since most of them are behind what they're, where they should be? Or do you think it's unnecessary? Um, I, I don't think that it should be mandatory for all students. There's some students who um, aren't as behind. It should definitely be a choice for students and for students who have that achievement gap, it should be strongly encouraged for them to go to summer school to narrow that gap. I read a study uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe it came out of Stanford, where they were looking at third graders 
and their reading abilities, and it's dropped by 30%. And that is pretty scary, especially with the low socioeconomic um, students who might not have a parent at home on a regular basis to, to read to them or them to read to that parent. And the studies find that if a student does not read well by third grade without heavy remediation, they will struggle to read for the rest of their life. And, and so we need those summer programs built in for students to have access to. Great, thank you so much. Okay, next up, we have Karen Perez Da Silva, and she'll explain what she's up to. Yeah, hi, hola, buenas noches. Good evening, everybody. My name is Karen Perez Da Silva, and I'm running for Beaverton School District Zone 2. Um, I go by she, her, and Aya pronouns. I'm a Latina mom in a blended family. I have a third grader, a fifth grader, a recent BSc graduate, and a junior in college. I'm an experienced teacher, administrator, researcher, um, and a doctor. I'm in getting here today. I've learned to use my life and cultural wealth as superpowers to support our community. I've experienced immigrating to the United States at the age of seven. Um, it, I'm a multilingual English language learner. I've experienced elementary school as a special ed student, and I've lived in situational poverty, and I've grown up in Oregon as a brown skinned Latina. Um, I'm currently working as the leader for equity and system improvements at Education Northwest. And I support districts um, here in our state and also nationally to co-construct more equitable out, um, educational policies, budgets, and systems. And I'm running for Beaverton School District Zone 2 because I want to use my professional, educational, and lived and cultural wealth to advocate for um, safe schools. And that includes safety around culturally responsive schools um, curriculum as well as safety so that students feel and experience belonging in the schools. Um, second, I want to address the equity and opportunity gap. Currently in our Beaverton School District schools, we have over 10% of our students who have either failed, not passed, or have incomplete SIN coursework. And we need concrete steps to see how we were going to address that. Third, I want to ensure that our students and our community have a voice and are part of the decision-making process here in Beaverton. Um, and I think that at this time, more than ever, we need to step up for our students to ensure that they have, sa that they're, have safe, um, equitable opportunities to allow them to thrive and not just survive in our schools. Um, it was great to see um, the two speakers today, Louise, um, our, our safe schools routes and our um, foundation, both of which are working for safer schools and really to support our students as a community. As a teacher, I actually um, put in for those um, funds um, and I received them from the foundation. Um, I was a Beaverton School District teacher for over 16 years um, and I've also worked at the district office. So I'm excited to be here today and um, yeah, so I don't know if you have questions as well. I'd be happy to answer. Um, the question that I asked uh, Jeanette, same yeah. thing. Do you think kids should be going to summer school? They should be, they should get the opportunity. They should be required. What's your feeling okay. on that? Yeah, definitely not required. I think parents should have that choice um, and be able to decide as a family what is best for their child. Um, but I do think that the opportunity should be there. Um, one of the, I'm working with a couple of school districts right now in figuring out how do you set up a summer program? Um, one thing is our teachers are really exhausted and to get the staffing for it um, is going to be a little bit of a challenge. Also, our students are a bit exhausted. So we're looking at how do you provide a program that will allow them um, and the research actually um, also shows that we need to make the academic, but also have the enrichment in there um, and not just make it enrichment. And we really also, the research also shows that we need to provide the summer opportunities that include that social emotional support for our students. Um, as Janet had mentioned, we have students who um, are really struggling with um, their mental health. And you know, students need to be with other students to really thrive. Our kids need that, that opportunity. I'm thankful that the Beaverton School District has actually given us a choice 
to either have our students return to CD, you know, to the classroom or to stay home. Um, in my case, I take care of my parents who are older and my daughter has asthma. So we're choosing to continue in CDL, but I know that we have many families that can no longer afford daycare for their children and they have to return to work. Um, we have families also that are actually choosing to keep their students home because they're concerned with the um, health and safety um, and having to take two weeks off if somebody in their home gets COVID or, um, and they can't afford to take those two weeks off to care for family and they wanna continue in the format that they're at. But we also know that we have students who would benefit from being in the classroom and having that hands-on activities and that one-on-one -on -one with the teachers. So I've appreciated that we have that choice to actually um, stay home. And that for your question, David, I think that it definitely needs to be a choice. We need to provide a variety of activities and opportunities that allow for students to build those relationships and re-engage with students and the schools for the following school year. We have students that have dropped off the radar um, and we need to figure out how to re-engage them. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So my understanding is that uh, Beaverton has one of, if not the highest rate of homelessness for school age students. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that the school has, the school district has a role in, in helping with that? And, and if so, what would you say it is? I would say most definitely we have a role in supporting our McKinney, our students that qualify for McKinney Vento, especially current, you know, even now where more and more families are qualifying because parents are losing their jobs or have lost their jobs. Some parents have had two incomes in their homes and now they have one or maybe not even that. So we have students who are trying to connect to school from a car or they are driving to a, a place where they can get connectivity. We have students who still have not connected on um, here in Beaverton School District as well. But for our McKinney Vento students, I, I strongly believe in wraparound supports for our students. Um, that includes not only, uh, well, there's laws around that too. Like we, we must provide those supports for our students that are homeless. We um, have to provide transportation for them to get to their schools. If they move, then we need to provide um, a way for them to continue um, in the least um, kind of restrictive um, school. So if I move several times within a year, I can stay at one school. I don't need to move every time that mm -hmm. my family has to change um, home housing or if I can get housing somewhere else. Um, we have some school districts are providing um, like hubs, they've set up these hubs where students can come and have a warm place to connect. Um, they've set them up almost like a Starbucks where they can come in, they have couches and there's food. There is, um, and Beaverton is providing food for all students. The um, CARES Act has allowed us to use funding um, for some of that and also has um, lessened the restrictions on how we can provide food and where we can provide food for students um, prior before COVID, we had to have the student actually show up to a school um, to receive the meal, eat it there, but now it can be picked up. Um, we don't have to ask as many questions. Um, we know that when students are hungry, their families, their parents are also hungry. Um, so I think that working with our, um, with our community, whether it's the city and other organizations that can make sure that we are providing food, um, healthcare, we have our health centers, which I think are critical for not only the physical health, but mental health of our students. So uh, most definitely, yes, we must provide um, a well-rounded um, support for all of our students. Great. Um, any other questions? Because I know we have one more person who wants to speak. Is, did she check back in, Francisca? That would be Ona. I still see Ona on the screen. We also have another guest who joined us. So I will bring them into the meeting if they um, want to speak as well. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Karen. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And anybody can vote for any of us. So even if you live, like my schools are Bethany, Jacob, Wismer, Oak Hills, Rock Creek, Sado, Springville, K-8, uh, Stoller, and Westview. Um, if you have an issue, 
and you are in those schools, then you would come to me and I would advocate for you with the school board. But if you're in zone one, um, you would go to the zone one person, but everybody in Beaverton votes for all the zones. So please come out on May 18th and vote. Um, it's really critical that you come out. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just add that um, ballots are mailed no later than mail May 4th as well. So you should be getting, getting those uh, end of April through the beginning of May. Um, and yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you both. Ona and Glenna, you are welcome to unmute yourself um, and, and share with the group if you would like. Great. Oh, Glenna. Nice. One of my Thanks. neighbors. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, hi, my name is Ona. Um, I split my time between uh, the El Monica neighborhood and St. John's, but uh, this area has been my childhood home. Um, over the past year, I've been uh, collecting trash, mostly in my vicinity. Uh, I basically needed something manual to do after spending a whole day at home on the computer. Um, it's kind of become my like physical Pokemon Go. Uh, so I noticed that um, on your website, you said that you've organized uh, cleanups in the past. And I was wondering if someone would be up to organizing one again. Um, it, I'm, it doesn't have to be like, you know, something like a, a huge, made into like a huge thing. Uh, maybe it can just be simple, like uploading an Excel sheet of various, um, areas, vicinities, roads uh, that need uh, to have someone um, clean them up just on like, I, I know there's like this program called Adopt-A-Block uh, where people get to um, sign up to, to maintain their uh, local block. Maybe that can be something that could be highlighted on um, the, uh, the neighborhood website. Um, uh, I, I don't know of any other ways that interested uh, people uh, uh, could also clean up trash. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, like I just noticed a lot more pile up of trash that's due to a lot of different factors. Um, and I want to see if there's other people out there who are interested in it. I've gone to solve events, but those seem to be more geared towards like natural areas in Oregon and downtown Portland. Um, but I haven't really seen anything uh, either in this neighborhood, at least for the last year, or in Beaverton in general. So are you specifically talking about the wetland area across from El Monica School or near El Monica School? Um, there's like a small uh, wetland area um, and uh, uh, I have cleaned up like the area um, around it, but um, I don't have like the means or the tools to go deeper into uh, or the, the, the water part. Um, that's like one of the areas I've seen that has uh, a lot of trash buildup. Um, uh, and in like uh, around like other uh, parks as well, but also just along roadways. Like when I um, drive or, or bike, I just, uh, it just seems like it's, it, I've seen just like the same pieces of trash that have like remained there mm -hmm. for a while. Yeah, well, uh, the NAC actually did a cleanup at that wetland near um, El Monica School, but I think it's been four years since oh, okay. we've done it. So mm -hmm. maybe we need to do another one. Um, how do your neighbors feel about this? Um, I don't have that uh, great of a relationship with my neighbors. It's mostly like a lot of uh, renters and it's hard to pin them down. So. Mm -hmm. So David, in, in the past, when the NAC did a cleanup, um, w was it just kind of people going out with there with trash bags and gloves, or, or did we have any of the, you know, the trash spears or, or grabbers or anything? Do you remember? 
Uh, well, um, let's see. I think we mainly, well, we didn't do it this time of the year. We did it in the summer. So mm -hmm. it was a lot drier. That's sure. the first thing. And then the city provided us with equipment like blowers so we could blow stuff mm -hmm. and containers to put the trash in. Um, so Francisca, is that something that, that the city could help out with if we, we had interested people in areas to clean up? Oh, sure, definitely. Yeah, we could, we could help provide um, some of the, the resources needed. Okay. And if it's a park, then the park district would also help out too. Okay. Would also, it be possible? Oh, sorry. Would it be possible like to put the adopt a block URL on the neighborhood website or no? Uh, yeah. I mean, Francisca, that's possible, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's your web page, so you know whatever whatever you would like to to put on it. Um, you know, we could. We could certainly help accommodate that. I manage the web pages, so if you just let me know what information you'd like to put on there, I'm happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I, mean, I, I think it's a great idea. Um, I think you're right. There's been a lot more trash recently, probably, you know, pandemic related. Um, right. Uh, you know. It, it sounds like Ona and David, you guys have some ideas on where some of this stuff may be, but maybe maybe a good start at least would be for for us here and people, you know, other NAC board members and such to try to figure out where are the real trouble spots, uh, you know, identify areas and then decide, hey, these are the areas we want to address, coordinate with the city, get the tools we need. And then just send stuff out, maybe put some signs up or whatever for the neighborhood to try to organize events, David, like we've done in the past with the with THPRD and the um, work parties. The, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, like a work party for trash. Yeah. Yes. And Ona, we do have uh, through the city, we can apply for matching funds to mm -hmm. do projects like this. So, okay. So if you have ideas, let them flow. <laughs> Contact mm -hmm. the board. OK. David, do you want to put your email address in the chat? Oh, OK. It, isn't it on the agenda? Hold on, let me see. I do believe it is on the agenda. Um, but I, I was just thinking for, for ease of use. Otherwise, I can put it, uh, hold on. it and put it in the chat there. Mm, let's see. OK, I just clicked on it, but. Here, I will, there we go, in the chat. There we go, yeah. Yes, so so Ona, get in touch and we can help support uh, that effort through resources from the city and you know volunteer efforts from the NAC. Okay, thank you. It's a great idea, Ona. Thank you for coming to that. Yeah, and thank you all to our guests. It was very interesting hearing about uh, your your backgrounds and your skills and your experiences. So thank you all. And our next meeting is about four weeks from today. I, I can't remember which day it is. It's April 27th. 20 August 20 or April 27th. April 22nd. So it's going to be right before the voters forum then, right? Yep. Yeah, it'll be two days before the voters forum. It'll be that week. Oh good. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming and good luck and be safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Francisca. Good You're job. Welcome. How's how's